Today, I'm discussing Lawrence Bonjour's In Defense of the A Priori. This is part of a debate with Michael Devitt in a book, Contemporary Debates in Epistemology. But today, I'm just going to do Bonjour's part. Uh, so I'll skip the abstract and just jump in with Bonjour's part himself. Now, the basic point of this debate, uh, a priori and a posteriori are two categories of knowledge and justification in epistemology. And the idea is that a posteriori knowledge is the kind of knowledge that you get from your senses and from experiencing living in the world, while a priori knowledge is the sort that is supposed to be accessible to pure reason and should, in some hypothetical sense, be prior to experience, though some of the subtleties will be discussed uh, later on. OK, so now he says, the official subject of this debate is the existence of a priori knowledge, but the main focus of my discussion will in fact not be a priori knowledge, but a priori justification, or rather more specifically, a priori reasons for believing something to be true. In approaching the issue in this way, I'm assuming both one, that justification is one of the requirements for knowledge, the only one to which the issue of a priori status is relevant, and two, that justification in the relevant sense consists in having a good reason uh, for thinking that the belief in question is true. But having stated these two background assumptions, I will say nothing further in support of them here. So for that first assumption, the idea is that knowledge is sometimes taken to be a certain kind of belief. It's a belief that's well justified. It's a belief that's true. Maybe there's more to it than that. But he's saying the justification is the only part of this that seems to depend on whether it's a priori or a posteriori. So that's the part he's going to focus on. And he's assuming that justification can be understood in terms of reasons. It's harder to see exactly what the alternatives here are, but uh, that's why he's not particularly uh, uh, trying to back up these assumptions. The view I will defend is that a priori reasons, in a sense yet to be clarified, do exist and in consequence that a version of epistemological rationalism is true. As we'll see a bit later, there's a historic debate in philosophy between those philosophers they call the rationalists who give primacy to a priori justification and to pure reason, and the empiricists who give primacy to experience and a posteriori justification. There's a historical debate between the continental rationalists of the 1600s, like Descartes, Leibniz, and Spinoza, and the British empiricists of the 1700s, like Hume, Locke, and Berkeley. This debate, of course, has changed at various points over the centuries, um, but it's something that philosophers keep coming back to over the centuries. So as uh, Bonjour says, the idea of an a priori reason, and also the associated rationalist view, has been understood in a number of different ways. And I will not be defending all of the specific claims that have been associated with this sort of position. My aim is to defend what I take to be a relatively minimal version of the idea of an a priori reason and of rationalism, more or less the most minimal version that is both philosophically interesting and reasonably faithful to the historical dialectic. All this will take some explanation. Okay. The nature of a priori reasons. As I will understand it here, the concept of an a priori reason has two basic elements, one negative and one positive. The negative one initially more obvious, but both in the end equally essential. And that is, he's going to say, there's something that a priori reasons are not, and there's something that they are. Negatively, an a priori reason for thinking that a claim is true is one whose rational force or cogency does not derive from experience, either directly, as in sense perception, or indirectly, as by inference of any sort, deductive, inductive, or explanatory, whose premises derive their acceptability from experience. That such a reason is, in this way, independent of experience, does not mean that someone who has undergone no experience of any sort could be in possession of it, since the possession of an a priori reason requires understanding the claim for which it is a reason. And experience, even experience of some fairly specific sort, might be required for that. So I think the idea is, he's saying, you might need to have certain experiences of the world in order to 
be a functioning human being, in order to have concepts, in order to understand sentences. But the idea is that uh, once you understand a sentence, certain of these sentences are ones that you can then be justified in believing without having that justification depend on the uh, on your senses. You might your ability to have the thought might depend on your senses, but once you can have the thought, the justification is independent of experience. That's the sort of negative characterization of an a priori reason. It's a reason that doesn't depend for its weight on experience. Okay, so now he says, uh, nor does the idea of an a priori reason when understood in this way imply either one that experiences of some sort could not also count for or against the claim in question or two, that such experiences could not override perhaps even more or less conclusively the a priori reason in question or still less, three, that an a priori reason renders the claim certain or infallible. So here, I think he is preemptively responding to certain objections that people have. So some historic conceptions of a priori knowledge, so for instance, Descartes' idea, is that there are certain things that you can just see to be true uh, through pure reason alone. And those sorts of things, Descartes might think, are known with complete certainty in such a way that they couldn't possibly be overridden by any experience. Now, many contemporary philosophers will say, if that's what the a priori means, then of course there's no such thing as the a priori. Because take any claim you want, say, take some mathematical claim, take some logical claim. There are certain experiences, it seems, that could override uh, your justification for that claim. The idea being, if a bunch of expert mathematicians came up to you and told you, we've discovered that everyone's been doing long division wrong. And so when you did that division problem just now, you also got it wrong. And the mathematicians tell you, we figured out a new uh, way of doing it and we get this different answer. The idea is even if those mathematicians are just lying to you, if they said it in a sufficiently convincing way, they could override your justification for believing a mathematical claim. At least many philosophers will think that. And Bonjour is saying, okay, that could happen, but that doesn't mean that your original reason wasn't a priori. He's saying, we have a conception of the a priori that means that this reason doesn't depend on experience, but uh, that doesn't mean that it couldn't be overturned by something that does depend on experience. And also that uh, you could have other experiences that would justify the very same claim that just as you could work out a long division problem for yourself, you could also be told the answer by someone and then being told is an experience. And so again, the idea is what he cares about is which reasons are themselves a priori, regardless of whether or not some experience could override them. And this is all to uh, avoid a certain objection that a certain stronger conception of the a priori would bring about. As he says, all of these further claims might be true in some cases, though not, I believe, in all or even most, but they in no way follow from or are essential to the basic idea of an a priori reason itself. Okay, so what then counts for these purposes as experience? Obviously, the paradigm cases are the various sorts of sense experience, including such things as kinesthetic experiences of bodily orientation in addition to those deriving from the five standard senses. Here, I think he's referring to the concept of proprioception, which is the sense that allows you to figure out where your finger is even while your eyes are closed so that you can touch your nose. And that's a sense. It lets you know where something is in the world. It's not one of the standard five senses. And psychologists have given all sorts of other senses that we have. And, uh, but his point is just that all of those count as experience. And then he also says, in opposition to a number of recent discussions, I would argue that introspective awareness of one's thoughts, sensations, and other mental states should also count as a variety of experience. And the reasons for belief that such experience provides as empirical rather than a priori. Introspective experience may not depend on clearly identifiable sense organs, but it is still pretty clearly an awareness of temporally located 
contingent facts that depends on causal relations between those specific facts and the correlative state of awareness. It is thus far more analogous to sense experience than it is to the sort of experiential process, if it should even be called that, that is involved in the most paradigmatic cases of allegedly a priori reasons. So that is, he's saying, if you can uh, think and just internally sense how you're feeling, what you're uh, thinking, what your experience, what your mental life is like, he thinks that, that is the sort of thing that we should also count as a sort of sense experience. It's very different from the sort of abstract reasoning that goes on in mathematics, which he thinks is the only true sort of a priori reason. And he says, basically, the same thing is true of even the reason for belief in one's own existence that is supplied by the Cartesian cogito, since this is based on introspective awareness of the occurrence of specific thoughts and sensations. So that is, this is a reference to Descartes' classic thought experiment, where he says, let's imagine that all my senses are deceiving me. Still, the very fact that I am having some experiences right now, that, that thing seems indubitable to me. And the fact that I'm having some experiences right now means that even if all of the external world is an illusion, my body is an illusion, and so on, Descartes thinks, still, I can't deny the fact that experiences are happening, and they must be happening to someone, and that someone, let's call them me. And so Descartes says, I am having these thoughts, therefore I exist, or shorter, I think, therefore I am. And what Bonjour is saying is that the thinking that Descartes is aware of, the fact of him being aware of this thinking and being aware of these sensations, that is the sort of thing that he still wants to count as a posteriori, not a priori. And so even Descartes' most uh, solid foundational claim is one that Bonjour wants to count as a posteriori. Nevertheless, he's going to argue that there are a priori reasons. Turning to the positive aspect of the concept of an a priori reason, the traditional view, which I believe to be essentially correct, is that in the most basic cases, such reasons result from direct or immediate insight into the truth, indeed the necessary truth of the relevant claim. A derivative class of a priori reasons, about which little will be said here, results from similar insights into the derivability of a claim from one or more premises for which such a priori reasons exist, or from a chain of such derivations. And a partially a priori reason may result from an a priori insight into the derivability of a claim from others established on broadly empirical ground. So that is, he's saying, uh, there are some a priori claims that we just know directly. And then there's others which, once we've figured out certain conditional, certain logical relations through this direct insight, as he puts it, we can put them together and generate longer logical proofs. And the idea is that for most mathematical claims, we're starting with basic premises that we can just immediately see to be true and taking steps, each one of which we can just immediately see to be true. And when we put them together, the end result may be something that is derived only from a priori reasons, but in a sort of indirect way. It's a combination of a bunch of a priori reasons. He wants to focus on the individual a priori reason. But as he's going to point out later, there's also cases where you go through some long chain of reasoning where some of your initial premises are empirical. You observe some things, then you do some mathematical reasoning, you put together the mathematical reasoning with the observations, and you get some more complicated statement. In a sense, this is how all of science proceeds, that we make some observations, we do some mathematical reasoning, we put them together and get a conclusion. And he's going to say that sort of conclusion depends both on the a priori reasons that go into the mathematical part and the a posteriori reasons that go into the experimental part. So he's going to say, though the term intuition has often been used to refer to these a priori insights, I will refer to them simply as a priori insights. Thus, I hope avoiding any confusion with the other uses of the rather slippery term intuition. And here, this is just philosophers have used the word intuition in a lot of ways, most of which don't exactly line up with the ordinary concept of intuition. So he's going to avoid that word. 
even though if you read other philosophical work on this topic, they will often use the word intuition for the a priori insights, even though ordinary people often use intuition for some sort of a posteriori sense-based um, experiences. Okay. Here it is important to be clear at the outset that insights of this sort, this a priori sort, are not supposed to be merely brute convictions of truth on a par with the hunches and fears that may simply strike someone in a psychologically compelling way. On the contrary, a priori insights at least purport to reveal not just that the claim is or must be true, but also at some level why this is and indeed must be so. They are thus putative insights into the essential nature of things or situations of the relevant kind into the way that reality in this respect in question must be. Okay, so he's pointing out, it's not enough to be an a priori reason just that you're convinced that something is true. Rather, uh, you have to be convinced that it's true in a way that actually justifies you. And hopefully he thinks it's justifying you because it is some sort of insight into the nature of the things that we're talking about. We'll get to some examples in a couple minutes, so don't worry about that. One other point about the nature of a priori insights should also be briefly mentioned for a variety of reasons, but most fundamentally because of the role that such insights are supposed to play in deductive inference. It is often and quite possibly always a mistake to construe them as propositional in form. The problem here is essentially the one pointed out long ago by Lewis Carroll, at least in the most fundamental sorts of cases, think here of modus ponens, the application of a propositional insight concerning the cogency of such an inference would require either a further inference of the very sort in question or one equally fundamental, thereby leading to a vicious regress. So here I'll put a link to the paper in the description. This is a famous classic paper by Lewis Carroll, the author of Alice in Wonderland. He was also a mathematician and wrote some important philosophy papers too. But uh, he points out that say that I've got some premise A, and I also know that if A is true, then Z must be true. And you might think, well, given those two, I can just therefore conclude that Z must be true. And that's what he wants to say, that given two premises, you can just see that the conclusion must follow. However, some people might insist, you can never see that something follows. Instead, all you can see is another sentence, namely that if A and if A then B, Z are true, then Z must be true. And if we just add that as another sentence, rather than allowing us to move from the sentences to the conclusion, then all we've got now is three sentences. A, if A then Z, and if A and if A then Z, then Z. And you might think, well, now I've got these three sentences, these must entail the conclusion, but someone who thinks that the insight always has to come in the form of another sentence are going to just say, well, all we've done is add one more sentence to our stock. A, if A, then Z. And if, if A, and if A, then Z, then Z. And also if A, and if A, then Z, and if A, and if A, then Z, then Z, then Z. And this just keeps going without end. At some point, you have to move away from adding another sentence and actually make a move in your inference, get to your conclusion. And he's thinking, it may well be that all a priori insights involve developing this ability to actually move from some assumptions to a conclusion, rather than just giving you justification to believe a sentence, which might be a conditional. So instead, he says, instead, I suggest the relevant logical insight must be construed as non-propositional in character, as a direct grasping of the way in which the conclusion is related to the premises and validly flows from them. And once the need for this non-propositional conception of a priori insight is appreciated in the context of deductive inference, it seems to me in fact plausible to extend it to many other cases as well. In particular, it seems plausible to regard the most fundamental insights pertaining to each of the examples listed in the following section as non-propositional in character. And I've checked the footnotes, they're pretty minor, so uh, you can see it at the end. Okay, new section. The argument from examples for the existence of a priori reasons. 
So here, this brief section is going to be one argument that he gives for the existence of a priori reasons. And it's going to just consist in giving a bunch of examples of statements that we seem to know, and we seem to know them independent of any experience. And so therefore, if this is right, they must uh, be based on a priori insight. And therefore, a priori insight must exist. That's the conclusion of his argument. OK, so why then should it be thought that reasons having this a priori character genuinely exist? One reason is that there seem to be many, many examples of propositions for which there are clear and obvious reasons of this sort. Here, the most obvious examples come from mathematics and logic. But there are many others of many widely varying kinds. For present purposes, a misleadingly short list reflecting some of the main types will have to do. All right, first example, two plus three equals five. How do you know that? Well, you just have some insight into the nature of two-ness, three-ness, five-ness, plus and equals. Just by understanding those concepts, you can see that this must be true. Now, there are some philosophers who have claimed that somehow this insight derives from experience. Bonjour says, at least plausibly, it doesn't. At least plausibly, it just depends on this rational insight. Second example, all cubes have 12 edges. This one, I think, is a little bit harder. I think I can see one way to see this, like picture a cube in your head and count. There's four edges of the square on top, four edges of the square on bottom, and four vertical edges connecting those squares. And so there's 12 edges. Now, if that's the justification, that's the sort of thing where you're using your mind's eye. And I think Bonjour wants to count that as a posteriori, but I think he says there's another way to be justified in believing this that just involves understanding what a cube is and understanding that by its very nature, it's going to have to have 12 edges. And that would be a priori. Now, a third example, this one's from logic. For any propositions P and Q, if it is true that P or Q, and it is false that P, then it is true that Q. So here it's just understanding what it is for P or Q to be true and noting that, well, if, P or Q, if, if one of those two is true and it's not P, then it has to be Q. This is sort of a basic logical insight. Example four, if object A is larger in a specified dimension, such as length, area, or volume than object B, and B is in turn larger in that same dimension than C, then A is larger in that dimension than C. The idea here is that this is just some insight we have into the concept of larger than that tells us that if A is larger than B and B is larger than C, then A must be larger than C. We don't have to, he says, have experiences to figure this out. Maybe we have to have experiences of the world to even have the concept of larger than. But once we have that concept, he thinks we're justified in believing this uh, just by rational insight. Uh, example five. No surface can be uniformly red and uniformly blue at the same time. Here, the concepts of red and of blue clearly depend on vision for us to have them. Certain blind people may not even have the concepts of red and of blue, but his claim is anyone who does have the concepts of red and of blue can see that this must be true, that nothing can be both fully red and fully blue. And so all of these, he thinks, are examples of statements that are true, and we can know them to be true, but our knowledge doesn't depend for its justification on any experiences. And there's going to be some contention about some of these, though, which is why he's going to provide another argument later. My basic claim is that anyone who understands and thinks carefully about each of these propositions will be able to see or grasp immediately that it must be true that it is true in any possible world or situation, and that the same thing is also true of indefinitely many further examples of these sorts and others. That is arithmetical, logical, geometric, uh, these relational about concepts like larger than and of colors. The central rationalist thesis I'm defending is that this sort of seeing or grasping constitutes other things being equal a good, indeed overwhelmingly compelling, reason for thinking that the claim in question is true, albeit not a reason that is capable of being stated as a separate proposition. 
Moreover, while independent experiential reasons might also be found for some or all of these propositions, insights of this basic sort do not depend on experience in any discernible way. That is, you could take two objects and take three more objects and then count them and get five. And you could do that a bunch of times. And that would give you some experiential justification for the claim that two plus three equals five. But he thinks you can also get this a priori justification. Similarly, you can look at a bunch of cubes and count their edges and see that they all have 12. But he thinks you can get independent a priori justification for this. You can go out into the world and notice that I've seen an object that's larger than another and another one that that second object is larger than. And the first one was always larger than the third one. That would be an empirical justification of proposition four. But he thinks we can have a priori justification of this as well. Examples like these, which could be multiplied more or less without limit, provide, I claim, compelling evidence for the existence of a priori reasons. And given the assumptions enunciated earlier, for a priori justification and knowledge. One who wishes to reject this conclusion and who does not adopt the quixotic stance of denying that we have good reasons for thinking that any of these propositions are true is obligated to offer some alternative account of those reasons one that makes them dependent on experience after all, initial appearances to the contrary. That is, he's saying, there's two ways you could deny the existence of a priori reasons for these propositions. One is, you could say, somehow all of these propositions ultimately rest on empirical, observational, experiential justification. Or the weirder thing you could try to do is just deny that we're even justified in believing these claims. That would be a sort of severe skeptical view, which a few philosophers might endorse, but it's not going to be a common viewpoint. My view is that there is no such specific and detailed account of examples like these, giving them empirical justification that has any real plausibility. One other point is worth adding before turning to other arguments in favor of the existence of a priori reasons. What is perhaps most misleading about the list of examples given here is that being chosen for their obviousness they are far from being the most philosophically interesting case of a priori reasons. I believe, in fact, that there are many more interesting, albeit less obvious, examples as well. Claims about the unlikelihood of complex coincidences of various kinds, certain moral claims, metaphysical claims about matters such as the structure of time and space, and many, many others. So this is an interesting part of the debate some philosophers might concede that these five claims and ones like them are knowable a priori. But Bonjour is also interested in saying much of our knowledge of ethics, of the nature of reality, about what sorts of things are plausible or implausible, likely or unlikely. He thinks these things can be known a priori as well. And that may be where some of the more interesting debate is, even if we agree with him that these five types of claims can be known a priori. OK, dialectical arguments for the existence of a priori reasons. So this section is giving another argument, which I think is the more interesting and much stronger argument for a priori reasons. For those earlier ones, there's a prima facie case. It looks like these are knowable a priori. But in the section we're about to go into, he's going to give some reasons that if we can know anything at all, we must have some a priori knowledge. While the foregoing argument from examples for the existence of a priori reasons strikes me as pretty compelling, it is from a dialectical standpoint, that is in the standpoint of arguments against the opponent of a priori reasons, it's still capable of being resisted. An opponent might deny that we have good reasons for at least some of the propositions in question dismissing the intuitive impression to the contrary as an illusion of some sort. That is, maybe someone thinks, we don't really have any good reason for believing that nothing can be entirely red and entirely blue. Or uh, they might also appeal to some account of how and why our reasons for the rest of them are really at bottom empirical. So just as for the cube one, maybe you have to actually count the sides in your head. Maybe for two plus three equals five, you actually have to do the counting. And if that's a process, that is involves your inner experience, then maybe that's empirical too. So someone might object to all these claims and say some of them aren't justified and some of them are justified empirically. I, Bonjour, find such views extremely implausible 
but there is no doubt that they are dialectically tenable as long as it is only such apparent examples of a priori reasons that are in question. That is, someone who wants to resist him can argue about all those things and neither side is going to definitively convince the other. But there are also other arguments of a more dialectical character for the rationalist view, which I want now to consider. These still do not make the rejection of a priori reasons completely impossible to maintain, but they make clear the intolerably high skeptical price of rejecting the existence of such reasons. So here he's about to give us this more sophisticated argument that he thinks might actually convince some opponents of a priori reason that there must be such things. I will consider two closely related arguments of this dialectical sort. The first is concerned with the relation between experience and certain of the beliefs which it intuitively seems to justify. On any account of the justificatory force of experience, there will be some beliefs whose justification derives from a direct relation to experience and others whose relation to experience is less direct. So for instance, I am currently justified in believing that there's a computer in front of me, and that seems to come directly from my senses. I'm also justified in believing that pandas eat bamboo. And that's not because I've directly seen pandas eating bamboo. I may have at the zoo at one point, but certainly the, uh, my direct vision of pam pandas hasn't been the main source of this justification. Rather, I've seen ink on pages. I've seen uh, video images on screens. I've seen all sorts of other things. All of that experience in my life somehow adds up to a broad justification for the claim that, well, among other things, that pandas eat bamboo, but also things like the earth goes around the sun. The sun is much larger than the earth. Uh, there are billions of people around the world that I have never met. I have justification for all these claims, but it's not directly from having experienced them. And so, now, this is the interesting thing. How does experience justify me in these claims that are other than the things that I've directly seen? The most straightforward version of this picture would be a broadly foundationalist view in which the more directly justified beliefs, like that there's a computer here, are justified by the content of experience alone without the need for any reasoning or any further premises. These sorts of views, these sorts of beliefs are then said to be the foundation on which my other beliefs are somehow built. Despite much recent criticism, I myself do not see how to avoid a view of this general kind while retaining the view that experience does indeed in some way justify beliefs. But even if this is mistaken, that is, there are some philosophers who say, even my belief that there's a computer here doesn't just rest on my experience, it rests on a whole set of other background beliefs, each one of which rests on each other in a sort of mutually supporting way. This is a view that they call coherentism as an, oppo as an opposition to foundationalism. But he's assuming foundationalism that at least some beliefs are directly uh, justified by experience and others are built on those. Uh, and he says, even if there is some more complicated story to be told concerning the directly justified beliefs, the problem to be described here will still arise about the justification of beliefs for which experience provides justification, but not in a direct or immediate way. So that is, he's saying, everyone accepts that there are some beliefs that are indirectly justified by experience rather than just being directly seen or heard or whatever to be true. Where exactly the line between beliefs that are directly justified by experience and those that are not actually falls is a difficult issue which need not be resolved here. All that matters for present purposes is that the class of beliefs that are broadly empirical, but clearly not justified by a direct relation to experience is extremely large and important. Something that is so for any conception of the scope of direct experiential justification that has ever been seriously advocated. On any such view, this indirectly justified class of beliefs will include at least beliefs about the unobserved past. So for instance, I believe that in 1066, there was a war in England. I didn't see it, but somehow I'm justified in believing it. 
two, beliefs about unobserved situations in the present. I believe that there are pandas in China eating bamboo. I believe that there are billions of people around the world that I've never met. Three, beliefs about the future. I believe that the sun will rise tomorrow. I believe that gravity will continue to work all afternoon. And in fact, tomorrow as well. I've never seen the future. I've never been there. How do I know that gravity still works and so on? Four, beliefs in laws of nature and similar sorts of generalization. And five, beliefs about unobservable entities and processes, such as those de described by theoretical science. That is, I believe that there are electrons in all of these objects around me. And I believe this, I mean, I believe this mainly because scientists have told me, but presumably they believe in these electrons, not by having seen electrons directly, because electrons are actually too small to see in any direct way. Instead, they believe them by somehow inference from other more direct observations that they've made. So all of these are beliefs about the world that are justified, and they're somehow justified by our experiences, but not because any of us has directly seen them to be true. Taken together, beliefs of these various kinds are obviously fundamental to our picture of the world and our place in it. But how can experience provide justification for beliefs of these kinds, if not directly? The only possible answer to this question, I submit, is that experience can provide a good reason for thinking that a belief in this category is true only if we have a logically prior good reason for believing some conditional proposition, having a conjunction of beliefs for which there are direct experiential reasons as antecedent, and the further belief we are focusing on as consequent. For only this can establish the connection between experience and something that it does not justify in the more direct way. That is, let's take my belief that there are billions of people around the world that I've never met. This belief is probably justified because I have read this fact in various online fact books, in encyclopedias. I've heard it from teachers. I've, it's come to me in a bunch of different ways. And so what we can say is uh, there's all these experiences I've had, these experiences that seem like reading an encyclopedia, that seem like hearing words coming out of a person's mouth. And he's saying something like, even before I saw these things or heard these things, I would have been justified in believing something like, if all the encyclopedias and teachers tell me that there are billions of people around the world, then in fact, there probably are billions of people around the world. And so the idea is, I have some belief in this conditional before I actually have the experience that fills the antecedent. Even before I see what the encyclopedia says, I am justified in believing that if the encyclopedia says that A, then A is probably true. If the encyclopedia says that B, then B is probably true. If the encyclopedia says that C, then C is probably true. Now, how am I justified in believing that conditional? Well, he says either that somehow rests on more empirical beliefs or it's a priori. And the idea is that if it rests on more empirical beliefs, then let's take those other empirical beliefs and build them into the conditional. We must be able to make a conditional that says something like, not just if the encyclopedia says that A, then A is probably true, but rather if you've had, if you have experiences over your life that make it seem that encyclopedias are reliable and the encyclopedia says that A, then A is probably true. This belief might then be a priori. It's going to not depend on any further experience. He's going to say, take the sum total of all my experiences. Somehow I must have, prior to having those experiences, he thinks, been justified in believing that if those experiences all happened, then I would be justified in believing that there's billions of people around the world. So he says, uh, the only possible answer to this question I submit is that experience can provide a good reason for thinking that a belief in this category is true, that is that there's billions of people in the world, only if we have a logically prior good reason for believing some conditional proposition, having a conjunction of beliefs for which there are direct experiential reasons as antecedent, and the further belief we are focusing on is consequent. 
For only this can establish the connection between experience and something that it does not justify in the more direct way. Here, it will make the issue clearer to suppose that the antecedent of our conditional is in fact a conjunction of all the propositions for which there are direct experiential reasons, even though most of these will be irrelevant to any particular consequence. What sort of reason could we have for thinking that a conditional proposition of the indicated sort is true? If all of the things for which there are direct experiential reasons are already contained in the antecedent, and if the consequent genuinely goes beyond the content of the antecedent, uh, as only some highly implausible reductionist view would deny for the sorts of claims in question, that is, the antecedent of this is just all sorts of statements about my direct sense experiences, the consequent is, there are billions of people around the world that I have never met. This antecedent doesn't logically guarantee that the consequent is true, but yet it must still somehow justify it. I must be justified in believing this conditional. Experience can offer no direct reason and no indirect reason without assuming some other conditional of the same sort for thinking that such a conditional proposition is true. It follows at once that the justification for a conditional proposition of this sort, if there is any, can only be wholly or partially via some other such conditional, a priori in character. In this way, the blanket rejection of the very existence of a priori reasons leads to a deep and pervasive version of skepticism, one in which we have no reason for thinking that any of the various seemingly empirical claims that are not directly justified by experience are true. And this is a result that seems far too extreme to be acceptable. That is, he's saying, if experiences can justify some beliefs indirectly, then the connection between those experiences and those beliefs must itself be given by some a priori insight. That's his claim. Because he thinks we need there to be such a connection. That connection can't be justified on the basis of experience because it's building in all the experiences already into the antecedent. And so therefore it must be a priori. Either that or we're never justified in anything in believing anything about the world that goes beyond our immediate experience. And that he thinks is too skeptical. Note that I have couched the entire argument in terms of reasons for thinking that the various beliefs are true and not in terms of knowledge. Thus, it would be possible for a defender of, of a view that does not appeal to such reasons in its account of knowledge such as a version of externalism. That is the idea that sometimes you're justified in believing things just because you happen to be reliable even though you have no reason for believing them. So an externalist of some sort might hold that we have knowledge of such matters while still denying the existence of the a priori reasons. He thinks though that uh, we need to be justified in this conditional. It can't just happen to provide the justification without us being justified in believing. But the admission that we have no reasons of any sort for thinking that such beliefs are true, even while insisting that we still have knowledge in a sense that does not involve such reasons, still constitutes in itself a very deep and implausible version of skepticism, especially when it is added, as it should be, that we also have, in the same way, no reasons to think that the requisite conditions for knowledge, whatever they may be, are themselves satisfied since there are no plausible views in which these conditions are ones whose satisfaction could be directly established by experience. The second dialectical argument, which I have space here only to indicate briefly, is in effect a generalization of the first. It questions whether any view that denies the existence of a priori reasons can account in any satisfactory way for reasoning itself. Here, the fundamental point is that a reasoned or argumentative transition from a claim or group of claims to some further conclusion relies again on there being a good reason for thinking that a conditional claim is true. In this case, one having the conjunction of the premises as its antecedent and the conclusion in question as its consequent. That such a conditional is true or probably true is in general not the sort of thing that could be directly established by experience. While to say that it is itself arrived at via some further process of reasoning is only to raise the identical issue about that previous step. My suggestion is that if we never have a priori reasons for thinking that if one claim or set of claims is true, some further claim must be true as well, 
then there is simply nothing that genuinely cogent reasoning could consist in. In this way, I suggest, the rejection of a priori reasons is tantamount to intellectual suicide. I think that's a really strong way to put this. Um, I suspect that many philosophers will just claim we're never justified in believing the conditionals. We are just justified in moving from the antecedent to the consequent. And that move is not the sort of thing that requires justification of its own. But I think he's right. If it does require justification of its own, then that justification would have to be a priori because all of the experiences we've had are in the antecedent. And we are talking about being justified prior to having the antecedent in the idea that if we got it, we'd be able to move to the consequent. Okay, so now next section. A priori reasons without a priori insight, moderate empiricism. In the space remaining, I will look briefly at two opposing positions. While virtually all serious epistemologists up to the time of Hume and Kant were rationalists in essentially the sense advocated here, that is that they believe that there's some a priori insight that gives us some knowledge without depending on experience. The dominant position since that time, and especially in the past century, has been a version of empiricism one that concedes the existence of a priori reasons of a sort, but claims that when properly understood, such reasons do not have the epistemological and metaphysical significance that is attributed to them by the rationalists. Instead, according to this moderate empiricist view, a priori reasons, rather than constituting insights into reality, reflect only linguistic or conceptual conventions or are merely matters of definition. The basic idea of moderate empiricism is to explain a priori reasons in a way that drastically undercuts their significance. For this purpose, the most standard version of moderate empiricism appeals to the concept of analyticity, holding both one, that all propositions for which there are genuine a priori reasons are analytic, and two, that an a priori reason for an analytic proposition does not require the sort of insight into the character of reality advocated by the rationalists. Analytic is generally understood as something like true by definition. It's just about analyzing the concepts involved. And so for instance, maybe you think the reason we know that nothing can be entirely red or and entirely blue at the same time is that analyzing the concepts of red and blue tells us that they uh, exclude each other. But it's just the concepts that I need insight into on that picture, not the world itself. Bonjour thinks that we do have a priori insight into the world itself. Many empiricists think that's spooky and think all we could have insight into is our language, our concepts. And then they want to say, there are some a priori justifications in knowledge, but it's just about our concepts. And then this knowledge of our concepts together with empirical knowledge gives us everything about the world. Bonjour is going to want to claim, no, we actually need insight into the world itself, not just into our concepts. He wants to deny even this moderate empiricism. The moderate empiricist allows for some a priori truths, but only analytic ones. The problem for a would-be moderate empiricist is to find a univocal conception of analyticity in relation to which both of these two claims can be plausibly defended. In fact, moderate empiricists have put forth not one, but many different and not obviously equivalent conception of analyticity and have tended to shift illegitimately among them, depending on which of these two theses they're defending at any particular moment. When the various conceptions of analyticity have been sorted out, they fall, I suggest, into two main groups. Some conceptions are reductive conceptions. They explain some cases of a priori reasons by appeal to other cases, while providing in principle no way to account for the latter cases. Here, the most obvious example is the Fregean conception of, this is relating to the philosopher Gottlob Frege, of an analytic proposition as one that is reducible via definitions or synonyms to a proposition of logic, where it is the propositions of logic that remain unaccounted for. So that is, uh, Frege thinks what it is to be analytic is to be uh, reducible to, by definitions, to a truth of logic. And then we just have direct insight into the truth of logic. And then our analysis of concepts reduces all other analytic truths to those. And Bonjour thinks 
having direct insight into the truths of logic, he thinks that's actually insight into the nature of reality, whereas Frege is going to say that's just insight into the nature of concepts. Other conceptions of analyticity, in effect, lose sight of the main epistemological issue altogether by equating analyticity with one of the features that a proposition for which there is an immediate a priori reason undeniably has, according to the rationalist account, without realizing that this fails to yield an independent account of the a priori reason. The plainest example of this mistake is the view that identifies an analytic proposition with one that is true by virtue of meaning. Once reductive accounts are set aside, this turns out to amount to nothing more than the view that one who understands such a proposition can see directly or intuitively that it is true where this is really just a misleading restatement of the rationalist view, not an alternative to it. In this way, I suggest the moderate empiricist view turns out under scrutiny to be epistemologically bankrupt. Again, a strong way of putting this claim, but he's saying either the moderate empiricist who accepts analytic truths, but no other a priori truths, either they have to reduce analytic truths to something that depends on the kind of rational insight the Bonjour claims exists, or they effectively are agreeing that there is this rational insight and using that to justify their analytic truths, which are the only a priori truths. And so a moderate empiricist who wants to concede that there are some a priori truths, but that they're only the analytic ones, Bonjour says, eventually they're going to see that even these analytic ones depend on all of these sort of direct insights into the nature of reality that he and other rationalists think are real. Final section, the rejection of a priori reasons, radical empiricism. A more radical alternative is to reject the very existence of any sort of a priori reasons, a view that has been advocated by Quine. I'll link in the description below to the paper Two Dogmas of Empiricism, where he defends this view that is uh, discussed here. There are two main questions that need to be asked about this more radical empiricist view. One is what the arguments for it and against the existence of a priori reasons are supposed to be. A second is whether, especially in light of the dialectical reasons in favor of a priori reasons offered above, it is possible for the radical empiricist to offer a non-skeptical epistemology. Quine himself tends to assume that Anyone who defends the idea of an a priori reason must be a moderate empiricist. And some of his arguments, in particular the famous circle of terms argument in uh, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, really apply only to that view and are thus irrelevant here. So here Bonjour is saying, Quine might convince the moderate empiricist that they should go radical, but Bonjour thinks Quine's not going to be able to convince the uh, rationalist who believes in substantive a priori reasons, that there's anything problematic with this circular definition. When these arguments, these Quinean arguments about a circle, circular definition are set aside, the only very clear argument that remains is one that appeals to the Duhemian thesis. This is based on a physicist, uh, Emil Duhem. Uh, he says that claims about the world cannot be experimentally tested in isolation from each other but only in larger groups. So here, the, the sort of example is that uh, if you want to test whether Newtonian gravitation is true, you might observe the trajectories of the planets around the sun, but when some deviations from the predictions are observed, you might reject Newtonian gravitation, or as they did in the 19th century, you might think there's another planet out there whose gravity is messing with the things you already know. You can never separate those two. And so you can never decide precisely which piece of evidence supports which particular claim. Two people might see the same evidence and one of them might say, okay, Newton was wrong. The other one might say, oh, Newton was right. We were just wrong about the number of planets. And in fact, in the 19th century, both of these things happened at, at one point. And in one case, they actually discovered the planet Neptune and saved Newtonian gravitation. In the other case, the planet turned out not to exist, and it turned out to be an error in Newtonian gravitation that Einstein eventually fixed. And there was no way to tell in advance which of these was the right move in either circumstance. And so Duhem and Quine claim that no individual statement is ever justified directly on the basis of experience. It's always 
our web of beliefs as a whole. Quine's extreme version of this thesis is the holistic claim that nothing less than the whole of science can be meaningfully confronted with experience. From this, he infers that any claim in the total web of belief, including those for which there are allegedly a priori reasons, might be given up in order to accommodate recalcitrant experience. And so apparently that such a priori reasons do not exist after all. But this conclusion simply does not follow, even if the holistic view is accepted. Quine is in effect assuming that the only reasons relevant to retaining or giving up a claim in the Weber belief have to do with accommodating experience. But this is just to beg the question against the existence of independent a priori reasons for or against such claims. So Quine claims, when we observe all the things that Einstein predicts, this leads us to give up certain claims about geometry that we thought were knowable a priori. And uh, he thinks if geometry can be revised on the basis of experience, then so could arithmetic and so could logic if we had the right sorts of experiences about the world. And Bonjour is saying, well, Quine's just assuming that experiences are the only things that ever lead us to revise stuff. So if you already assume empiricism, then of course you get this radical empiricism. But Bonjour wants to say, some of the reasons that we have are a priori. And if this assumption is not made, that is the assumption that there are no a priori reasons, then the rationalist can freely admit that holistic empirical reasons of this sort may count against a claim for which there is an a priori reason or the reverse, with the ultimate outcome depending on their relative weight in a particular case. That is, if I try to do some mathematical calculations and some mathematician tells me about the answer, I'm going to weigh the a priori reasons I have based on my calculations against the empirical reasons I have from the mathematician and see which ones come out ahead. Though the rationalist will also insist, see below, that the very connections among beliefs that result in the holistic web can only be understood as a priori in character. The other main issue concerning Quine's radical empiricism is whether it can offer a genuinely non-skeptical epistemology. While the details of Quine's view are quite obscure, it is clear that a claim is supposed to be justified in virtue of being an element of a system of beliefs, some of whose members are appropriately related to experience and which as a whole satisfies certain further criteria, such as simplicity, scope, explanatory adequacy, fecundity and conservatism. Consider then the conditional proposition that if a claim satisfies all of the conditions thus specified, then it is likely to be true. And ask what reason there is for thinking that this conditional proposition is itself true. Clearly, such a proposition is not directly justified by experience and to appeal to its conclusion in such a system of belief would be plainly circular. Thus, either there is an a priori reason whether immediate or resulting from a more extended a priori argument for thinking that this conditional proposition is true, or there is no reason at all. If the latter is the case, then Quine's view fails to yield genuine justification. While if the former is the case, then his rejection of the a priori reasons is mistaken. In this way, it can be seen that the idea of an a priori reason is both indispensable for any justification beyond that yielded by direct experience and at least as well understood as the idea of holistic empirical justification, which turns out in fact to depend upon it. It is worth adding that similar points could also be made about the claim that the various Quinean criteria are themselves satisfied. I suspect Quine will not be convinced by this. Quine would just say that, uh, no, you just have to reason in this sort of way, but there's no justification for that claim. That's just what reasoning is or something like that. Maybe Quine himself wouldn't say that, but some empiricist might. But I think this is a fairly strong argument that there must be some sort of insight that we have in addition to our experiences, and that this insight is somehow playing a foundational role in the justification of our beliefs.